to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch, and I'm here with Dr. Ake Nicholas, who's a lecturer in linguistics at Massey University of New Zealand in Auckland, and a speaker of Cook Islands Maori. Hello, welcome. Hello. <laughs> uh, so yes, welcome, welcome to the show. I'm so pleased that we managed to make this line up with me being in Australia and you also visiting Australia. And so the Canadian and the New Zealander will be sitting in a room together talking about language and linguistics. Very convenient. <laughs> so let's start with a question that we ask all our guests on Lingthusiasm. How did you get into linguistics? Well, if you go back enough into my early life, I've got a quite quite a cute early life story about that. Okay. So my family heritage is from the Cook Islands, mm -hmm. which we'll talk more about in a minute. And when I was a baby, my parents moved back there and I lived there until I was about six years old, which was after I'd started school. And so when we moved to New Zealand when I was about six, I had a little bit of language adjustment issues coming mm -hmm. into an English medium school. Um and, you know, cultural differences and migration trauma and all the rest of it. And I got taken pity on by a teacher who wasn't my teacher, but she was a te another teacher in the school who was Māori, New Zealand Māori. And she pulled me aside one day and said, oh, you know that your language is quite a lot like our language. Mm. Um, why don't you, um, do you, know, you know, sing me a song and we can talk about it. And so I sang a song for her and we went through, like, the things that were the same and the things that were different. And she oh. told me how it worked in New Zealand Māori and it was... You know, that's so lovely. <laughs> At the age of six, I was like, something very exciting is happening here with these languages and this thing. And I was also extremely grateful to her for doing this nice, kind thing. Oh, of course. Um, <laughs> and making me feel good about it and feel not feel stink about wanting to use a different language. Mm. I feel, feel stink. That's quite a New Zealandism, isn't it? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at that tender age, I sort of became aware of this thing about relationships between languages and, you know, the powerfulness that using a different language makes in your social world and all that kind of stuff and sort of was very meta aware of it from a young age. Also, my parents were really involved in the Kohanga Reo movement in New Zealand, which is the sort of reasonably well-known language revitalization sort of method of language immersion preschools. Oh, is that the language nest? Yeah, so that translates as language nest, which is what they're called in other places now. Okay. But yeah, so that that is you may or may not know, got started in, in New Zealand yeah. and with the Maori language revitalization. And so um, my parents were part of that movement. And so being aware about language and being aware about language revitalization is something that was sort of a, a very important narrative through my whole childhood. So um, were you a kid in one of those language nests? I was a little bit too old for it, uh -huh. but my younger siblings were. Oh, that's yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I read a thing that Joshua Fishman wrote once. So he, he's a language revitalization theorist mm -hmm. who, whose work has been quite influential in the New Zealand context for language revitalization. But he said that when he was a child, every day at the dinner table, his father would ask the whole family, so what have you done to support the Yiddish language today? Mm. Like, then that he says that, you know, so I feel like that was a similar thing for me in my childhood. It was a very overt thing that was very, very important to be worrying about looking after our languages and doing whatever we could to do it. So, so maybe yeah. just for people who haven't heard of the the, the language nest like how does how does that work so it's just like a normal preschool or early childhood education as we call it so kids mm -hmm. before they go to primary school or elementary school is it called <laughs> in other places um and it's entirely in theory entirely conducted in 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 our case in maori so mm -hmm. all, all the talking and all the teaching and all the songs and and not just the language but the cultural practices and all of that kind of thing yeah, the food and going out on the land and stuff like yeah, that and all that kind of stuff and also you don't just go and leave your kids and never think about it. The mm -hmm. parents and the whole family, the whanau as we call it, are expected to be involved in, in that educational experience. And that's a useful thing for language revitalization as well because it's not just the three-year-olds who are in their learning language, mm. the, the parents who maybe don't know and the grandparents who maybe do, which was the situation at right. that time then, work together so that the whole family gets access to that learning and it's... um. It's very effective when it's resourced enough to be put in practice. Well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because you can see if, like, oh, you only run this for a year, then you've got a bunch of one-year-olds who can say, like, two or three words, and yeah, yeah. you've got to have it, have it keep going so they can keep doing it for a number of years and become really fluent speakers, because that's how most people become fluent speakers, is being exposed to it from their, their parents and their grandparents and that's stuff like right. this. So yeah. it's creating a very natural environment, but doing it with a lot of deliberate planning to think about here's how you can actually make an environment happen where you don't just kind of let English take over. Well, yes, exactly. And in a context like in New Zealand where, like in most English-speaking places, most of the people 
on, uh, monolingual and only speak English and English right. is very, very dominant in all yeah. spheres of life. And where we had a situation in New Zealand, in the New Zealand Māori context, where there was a time where the language didn't get transmitted to the children. So the people who are my parents' generation, the ones mm-hmm. we call the baby boomers, yeah, most of them didn't learn Māori when they were children. And so in the early 80s, when this kohanga reo language nest thing was starting up, the parents didn't speak or could understand but didn't speak, passively bilingual as we call that. Um, yeah. And But there were grandparents alive who still did. So that process made use of those family members that were available to make it work. And and the children learning that language in turn facilitates that parent generation learning right. the language. And that and that was the, the model that got, you know, deliberately made And the parents can be way. kind of less intimidated to learn because they only have to learn at the pace of a child, which is maybe just a few words at a time, and they have all that tolerance for error. At that exactly, point. exactly. And, um, yeah, and that was a, that happened in quite a grand scale in the sort of mid early to mid-1980s in New Zealand, and it's... Uh, it's been spreading still going other... strong today. And, yeah. yes, and that method has spread to other parts of the world, uh, Hawaii, for example, and another really successful place where they've instigated that is in Wales with the revitalization of the Welsh oh, language yeah. and they're doing great there with mm. their language revitalization and that's starting out doing the same sort of system. You so know. you had language on your on your brain, on your mind constantly from when you were a kid. Yeah, heavily indoctrinated from a young child. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then what what made you say, okay, so here's this language revitalization thing. How did academic linguistics enter the picture? <laughs> <laughs> When I was in my second year of university, some people said, you should take that linguistics paper, it's really easy. <laughs> <laughs> was it really easy? Um, sort of, but I, you know, went along and, and took this linguistics course and I suddenly, you know, realised that there was a lot of really interesting sort of exciting things in that in in that broad area that you know caught my attention and yeah. so I carried on which I think is a fairly common story in I, that I think it's a pretty common story yeah. yeah yeah and yeah quite early in the once I decided that was what I wanted to study I you know and I learnt that my language which is Cook Islands Māori wasn't properly described yet mm. linguistically I kind of knew that that was what I was eventually going to have to do once I'd got enough training to know how to do it. So there was sort of a bigger than me kind of social motivation. Yeah, and to distinguish yeah. it from New Zealand Maori, which is different. Yes, yeah. So do you want to talk about that now? Yeah, I, I guess let's... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so mostly I've been talking about New Zealand Maori when I was talking about the language nest and all that kind mm-hmm. of thing. So that's the famous language from New Zealand. It's usually just called Maori. <laughs> right. Um, but... It's not actually the only indigenous language that is associated with the nation state of New Zealand. Right. Um, And the nation state of New Zealand is a different phenomenon to what people maybe think of when they think of New Zealand, which is the North Island and the South Island and the sort of main part of New Zealand. But there's some other islands. Yes, there's other parts of what is actually... So the legal entity of the nation state of New Zealand is something called the realm of New Zealand. And that includes New Zealand proper, which is the bit people are mostly thinking about with the North Island and the South Island, yep. and just off the west, east east coast of Australia. Yes. <laughs> yep. Um, the West Island, as we sometimes call it. Um, <laughs> but Australia is the West Island. Yeah, okay. it's the yeah. West Island. So we've got the North Island and the South Island and the West Island. Yep. <laughs> I like this. Yeah. Um, but there's actually other bits. Mm-hmm. So there's the Cook Islands, mm-hmm. which has 15 islands in it and a few languages. Mm-hmm. There's the island of Niue, which is... Um, in West Polynesia near Tonga and the islands of Tokelo, which is up by Samoa. And they are and they all have people and languages which come from there. So all of those languages, which is quite a few, yeah. are technically indigenous to this legal entity of the realm of New Zealand. Right. Which is a different concept to Aotearoa, which right. is the Maori word for the Maori nation, which only has one language, which is Maori. Uh, and that is what's also known as New Zealand's Maori. Yeah, also New known Zealand as Maori. New Zealand Maori. So yeah. Aotearoa has a language which is spoken on the North Island and the South Island. Yep. And then there are these other languages. Yeah, other different languages. Other different languages. Right, okay. Yeah. And they have a confusing thing, or our two in particular have the confusing thing of having the same name. Yeah, so is that also the case in the language? Yes. So in oh. the language, 
if you were calling the language by its name, both groups would call their language Māori or Te Reo Māori. But there are differences when you actually look at the But words. they are different languages. They're not mutually intelligible. They're 400 years apart in history and so on. But they happen to have the same name and come from the same place and the people are culturally fairly similar and look the same as each other. And So at one, at one point they were probably the same language and then they just, people, they, they split apart it. Yeah, and yeah. Start talking to each other as much or something. Yeah, so in the migration of Polynesia, the southern Cook Islands is where probably where most of the people who are the Maori people of New Zealand came from okay. in, in that part of the migration is the southern Cook Islands and the society islands of southern French Polynesia. That That's the immediate jump jump off point in that final migration to what's now New Zealand or Aotearoa. So and that happened about eight hundred years ago. Okay. And Which is plenty of time for languages to diverge from each absolutely other. Absolutely plenty of time. There hasn't been ongoing contact for contact between those two groups for about four hundred years. So there's about four hundred years of definitely no contact between those two languages. So but indeed that is plenty of time to become Which a if, even four hundred years ago yep. years is yep. plenty of time. Plenty, plenty. Yeah. Yeah. Like four hundred years ago is like Shakespeare. Like that's that's quite different. Yes, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. And here's my example. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what a waste of and 800 years ago yeah. was like like Chaucer <laughs> or older than Chaucer, which is really very oh, different. It's, in, it's entirely a different language. Yeah. Incomprehensible. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we can definitely link to some sort of map of this linguistic situation with the islands because I am definitely not a stranger to this part of the world and cannot picture most of this. So a map is there's a language yeah. map that we could probably link to. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Make sure to check out the show notes afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Good. Um, so there's these languages and you at age like 20 or so were like, here's my language, which has not been described very well. I want to write some descriptions of it or make some resources, make some stuff in it. Yeah. So yes, eventually I was a bit older than 20, but or, like, <laughs> you at age, <laughs> young Ake was like, here's what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah. So I learned how to be a descriptive linguist mm-hmm. and for my PhD, I did what's known as a description and documentation of my language, which is Southern Cook Islands Māori. The documentation side involves collecting lots of examples of language, whether that's written stuff or video or audio, of all as many different kinds of it as, that, as you can, and then writing it all down and making it usable for the other side Translating of it. Translating it and yep. transcribing it and annotating yep. it's all what ex- everything's doing. Extremely laborious, time-consuming <laughs> yes, process. <it> is. <laughs> um, and then the description part is, sometimes this is called writing the grammar. Mm-hmm. So that's where you describe how the language works, right from how the sounds work to how you make words and how you make sentences and even how you have conversations. Although I didn't get time to do much of that in my PhD because that's the hard part. But um, Did you end up having to write a dictionary for it as well? Or were you um, like, no? Yeah, so we were fortunate in that we, we already had some good dictionaries. Oh, good. So a lot of people, when they're doing a, a documentation project on a, on, a, on a previously undescribed language, that's an important first thing that they need to do is they need to collect all the, as many of the words and make a dictionary. But um, I was lucky that we actually had that was also really so that made it easier yeah for sure yeah it was also easier that i already spoke the language <laughs> you didn't have to do that like okay so does anybody here want to talk to me yeah <laughs> you let me sit with you so you didn't have to do the like i'm going to sit with the speaker and record them and ask them can you say this word can you say this word you're just sitting with yourself and a recorder well or your i guess friends and family at this yeah, point more well. that one yeah yeah i tried not to do t- to do too much recording of myself because my language is corrupted by too much exposure to new zealand maori oh okay so I don't have a good, authentic sort of Cook Islands <laughs> way of talking because I spent most of my childhood in the New Zealand Māori context. So I speak a funny mix of like New Zealand Māori sounds and Cook Islands Māori sounds, and it's all a bit muddled up and funny. So I, especially for uh, sound-based things for phonological stuff, I didn't want to use me because I was. You want to make sure you're, you're accurately representing yeah. what, what everyone else is doing and not, yeah. you know, the individual situation in your own head, which I'm sure is very interesting, but yeah. maybe less relevant to yeah. a broader group of people. Yeah. Or just not not so much the content of what I was saying, I'm talking about the... Oh, the actual sounds that you're saying. Especially stress. Hmm. Okay. Different systems, and I do it the New Zealand Māori way. Interesting. Why intuition most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. So you're recording friends and family and doing this, and... Fast forward to today, you teach at a university about linguistics and Maori or some sort yeah. of combination of the two? Yep. Yes. Or, yes, all of those things. So I teach linguistics 
so just the normal how do languages work in a broad way and the mm-hmm. little different subsections of languages and how they work and uh, in particular Pacific languages and the relationship between Pacific languages and then also I'm involved in some language teaching for both of those languages for Cook Islands Māori and New Zealand Māori. Yeah. And so you're doing like revitalization type projects or I guess it's is it kind of revitalization at this point if you've had this successful program since the 1980s? Well two different contexts here. Yeah. Um, but in both cases, the answer is still yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so in New Zealand, a lot of resources have gone into looking after the Māori language and to revitalising and building up and all of that kind of thing. But it's still it's still classified as endangered and most of our kids are still not speaking and most of our kids are still not in Māori medium schools right. and most people in New Zealand still don't speak Māori. And right. as a general rule, most Māori people in New Zealand would quite like it if everybody in New Zealand spoke Māori all the time and that was the language that we all used, which is a bit of difference between some of the contexts in North America about how things work. But Yeah, because yeah, there was this thing with your prime minister who was like, I'm going to send my kid to a Māori-speaking school and she's not Māori, but she was making this political statement of like, this is the type of thing that is a very popular thing to, to do. Yes, and that was received positively by almost everybody that that suggestion that she made and that yeah that doesn't work like that in other parts of the world where other people indigenous people's languages those people don't necessarily think it's appropriate for outsiders to use that language whereas in the new zealand context partly because essentially contrasting to what i said earlier there's only one language to worry about (laughs) as far as people think yeah and that language is associated with that place Right. This is often the case with, with indigenous languages. And if mm-hmm. you're going to be in that place, you should speak that language. It would be best if you were operating in that language. Yeah. So, um, that goal is still a little way off, but there's a pretty positive attitude towards Maori and New Zealand. And there's a few the kind of phrases that have kind of made their way into New Zealand English, like from Maori, even if they're not like the whole, the whole language. Yeah. Well, quite a lot, really. Um, I heard someone say recently that the most unique thing about New Zealand English is the, the Māori words that are in it, and the kit vowel, I suppose. But like, <laughs> <laughs> and the vowels are uh, other, other, are, are other also very interesting too. But like, <laughs> the most obvious unique thing about it is that there are a bunch of words from other Māori. varieties of English have this and that vowel. Yeah, but no, no other varieties of English have all these Māori words, and there's a lot. Like, it's not just a few; it's you know hundreds, mm. hundreds of words or phrases or expressions from. Obviously, place names and flora and fauna names, and names of animals and plants and things, but also lots of words for other parts of life, kinship words, cultural concept words, greetings, for example. Yeah, I yeah. watched a New Zealand YouTuber once, and like she was, you know, definitely not Maori, and she just started her channel with Kia Ora, everybody, blah blah blah. And I was like, I've never heard this. I had to go look it up, and I was like, oh, it's from Maori. Yeah, and that is well, that that. Kyoto, which just means hello, I think probably you could categorize that as having been a long time ago actually become part of English. Mm. That's an everyday greeting that almost anyone, there's nobody in New Zealand who wouldn't understand that. Yeah, she didn't, but, like, this wasn't a video about, like, the yeah. language context or anything like that. She was just, like, doing a video about her life, and this is what occurred to her to say. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that hasn't always been the case. Mm. It was actually, this is the, there's a iconic story about one of the things that sort of triggered off, you know, a- activism for for revitalizing the Maori language. So as recently as 1984, <laughs> very recent, which is well, it depends how old yeah. you are, but yeah, on, the, on, on a human scale, very yeah. recent, only a generation or so ago, um, an incident happened where a Maori woman got in trouble, and I think she even got threatened with getting fired for answering the phone at her job at the post office by saying kia ora, which is how we say hello, yeah. and she got in trouble for it, and she quite rightly decided that that was an unacceptable thing to get in trouble for, and that was a sort of starting off point for some of the more invigorated uh, activism to promote the use of the Māori language in the public space in, in New Zealand, not just in the Māori context. But yeah, so in 1984, which is sort of quite recent, it was yeah. like, oh, you can't say kia ora. And now, like, and, everyone's saying yeah. it and no one's thinking yeah. anything of it. Yeah. I mean, it's not absolutely considered to be wonderful. Like, we, there is a little corner of the grumpy mm. old men, you know, who are like, <laughs> what are you talking that language on the radio for? I can't even understand it, blah, blah, blah. But mostly people just laugh at them. Yeah. 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 So it's, like, which is, which is, it kind of reminds me of, uh, I was in Hawaii a couple of years ago and everyone says, you know, aloha and mahalo and things like that and that's just part of how people talk yes. and they don't realize that people might not know who are who aren't from there what mahalo means or yeah like this. yeah exactly okay so that was new zealand maori which has got this quite 
established linguistic situation. Um, and Cook Islands Maori is different. Yeah. So in the Cook Islands context, I, I quite often say that we're a generation behind the New Zealand context. So okay. the Cook Islands is as we mentioned before, not part of mainland New Zealand. And constitutionally, the Cook Islands' arrangement with New Zealand is that they are internally self-governing in Mm -hmm. free association with New Zealand. So that means the Cook Islands has their own government Mm -hmm. that make the laws inside the Cook Islands. But anything dealing with the rest of the world, like the United Nations or if we decide to invade the United States or... (laughs) (laughs) Military related things, right? International affairs is still operated by New Zealand, and everybody in the Cook Islands is a New Zealand citizen and has a New right. Zealand passport. So it's an interesting sort of constitutional arrangement, which was copied by the Federated States of Micronesia in related in relation to the United States. So they have the same huh. constitutional arrangement with the United States. Interesting, different from some of the other United States territories but yeah yeah um so and that applies to the cook islands Niue, and tokelo and each of those are individually self-governing yeah although in this so Niue is the same as us more or less the same as the cook islands tokelo is a little bit more new zealand hard out not even separate at all right um and so it's a generation behind in the linguistic situation as well uh, yeah okay yeah so because as is the case in most of the world places that are in the tropics Mm -hmm. even if they got momentarily colonized by European people. The European people didn't stay there, which is a pattern that's happened around didn't the like world. like the climate as much. It's a bit too hot for them, that's right. Like, <laughs> but too hot for me, I should say. <laughs> so unlike in New Zealand, where the, the majority of the population, 70-something percent still is Pākehā, which is our word for the New Zealand people of European descent. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Cook Islands is majority indigenous population and always has been. Mm-hmm. And so that protected that population from the language loss for longer. Right. Until the, about the 1980s, when, you know, one thing that happened was the airport got made big enough to take the big jumbo jets, ah. and which increased the number of English-speaking tourism. tourists who came and the, increased the ease of contact with the English-speaking world. And also right. another thing that happened was TV broadcast started then, right. which is all in English. And these things happened, which led to a, what we call in sociolinguists a shift yes. towards <laughs> English and away from away from Māori, the community language. But that didn't start happening until the mid-1980s. So when right. I was a child in the early 80s going to school in the Cook Islands, all the kids spoke Māori to each other. Right. Pretty yeah. much everything the, was just in Māori. Māori was the normal language, the lingua yeah. franca, as it gets called. <laughs> the normal language that people use for everything. Yeah. Um, people knew English as well, but would prefer to use Māori for most things. And if you go to the post office or the grocery store or something, yes. everything's in Māori. Yeah. And at, importantly, at school. Right. Yeah. yeah. The language of instruction really is Māori. Yeah. yeah. But around that time in the mid to late 80s, that started shifting, including the language of instruction in school. So now oh. the language of instruction in school is predominantly English in most places. So this this language shift that had happened in New Zealand before the 80s is now happening in Cook yeah. Islands in the so, 80s and 90s. Yeah, so now we're in the situation, probably the situation in the Cook Islands now is probably the equivalent of the situation in New Zealand in the early 80s when people noticed there was a problem and made the kohangareo and all that kind of stuff. So at this point, like the parent generation currently doesn't necessarily speak Maori, yeah. but the grandparents still do. Yes, that's right. Yeah, exactly. So with the grandparent generation, still speakers, the parents, some mm-hmm. still do, but mostly not, and mm-hmm. the kids definitely mostly not especially in Rarotonga, which is the most populous island in the Cook Islands and in New Zealand proper, (laughs) where most Cook Island people live. Because if you remember I said before, Cook Islanders are New Zealand citizens. So just with the general habits that have been happening with humans in the last hundred years or so of urbanisation and so on and moving to the big cities for work, most Cook Island people, like two thirds, Mm -hmm. live, live in New Zealand. Oh, so a lot of people have moved to New Zealand as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that uh, is a prohibitive factor for language maintenance. Right, of course. So it makes and it harder to keep speaking your community language. Yeah, and yeah. and there's a question of like, well, if you're a Cook Islands Maori person, are you going to send your kid to a New Zealand Maori school because they're going to learn the wrong Maori for Well, them. yes, and that is a thing that happens. Right. Because there's almost no Cook Island Maori equivalents that you can do in New Zealand. There's a few little punangareo, which is what we call the kohangareo. It's the same concept. Yes, there's a the few of them, but not yeah. heaps and heaps. And there's no Cook Islands language medium schools in New Zealand. Right. 
so yeah so a lot of cook island kids do actually go through the new zealand maori system because parents are taking the choice they say oh well we can't have our one we'll have the next best thing right that's probably a good thing because that's still getting some of those basic systems into those kids at a young age where yeah and it's still kind of a related language so it make it easier for adults right. to try to learn the the one that's actually theirs or at least it's they're closer in culture yes. because they did have this common historical connection 800 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. And relations between those two groups are generally amicable. Yeah. yeah. More, more than that, actually. <laughs> Friendly. Okay. We're a close family. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so that's the situation with, with Cook Islands Maori. It's kind of more complicated and there's less stuff going on. Yeah, so at the moment, going on. Uh, uh, Cook Islands Maori is more endangered than New Zealand Maori. Right. It seems surprising because people think, oh, well, there they are in the Cook Islands, they're okay, they don't have the English problem with the people, the English-speaking people there, yeah. forcing a shift to English that happened in New Zealand, you know, 100 years ago. But um, because of this modern world and globalisation, it's still, the effect is still, has eventually still happened. And now we're in that sort of crisis point where we've, we've stopped our intergenerational transmission right. in most places. And this is a dangerous thing because it doesn't really matter how many speakers you've got, if your children aren't learning, You're, then in a hundred years they're not going to be around. Yeah, well, in twenty or years, twenty even. years, yeah. Even if the speakers yeah, as soon are as Nana dies, right? <laughs> you know, it, right. it can happen really fast. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. That's, I mean, it seems like oh, we've got thousands of speakers, but if they're all over sixty, then that's, that's right. That's a really unstable situation. That's, that's right, exactly. Yeah. So that's where we that's where we in the Cook Islands context. That's where we are, which is a more perilous sort of state. And because we're a smaller language and we don't have this status as being the prime minister is not the, trying to learn your language. That's right. That's right. Jacinda Mania is not teaching the <laughs> baby Mania how to speak Cook Islands Maori. Um, <laughs> Maybe she should. <laughs> Well, she could definitely do both at once, right? Yeah. <laughs> Babies can do that. They're really good yeah. at learning languages. <laughs> Closely related ones, different ones, all of them. Like, <laughs> but yeah, so there isn't, because there isn't that sort of institutional support in the New Zealand context where most Cook Island people are, there mm-hmm. isn't a lot of resources for trying to do things to help the revitalization. Yeah. Right. And, but you're, and you're doing some kind of interesting things with respect to, okay, there's this TV coming in, you know, well, if the kids want to watch the TV, let's give them the TV, but in Cook Island's not right. Yeah. So, so one of the th- problems that we're having with our language revitalization endeavors that we, the people of the Cook Islands, the older people who are speakers, yeah. are having is a problem that is experienced in lots of language revitalization contexts where we can sometimes or often have trouble gathering up mm-hmm. our target, which is our young people, our children mm-hmm. and our young people, because something about the sort of traditional way that you try and do it is, isn't attractive to they them. They don't always want to go off with their grandparents and learn traditional things and they want to be on their iPads or whatever. Yeah, so that's the sort I try to not say it is quite as deficit as that. <laughs> okay. like, so, the, so the common thing is like, oh, the kid's just interested in their phones and they don't want to know about our traditional things and they're just interested in modern life and computer games. Yeah. You know, that's the sort of anti-child position. That's the, that's the gripe version <laughs> yeah, of yeah. that. I try to say that a lot of our young people are quite sort of um, insecure about their, their language skills and, and about their cultural skills. So because along with that stopping learning the language, mm-hmm. another thing that just automatically happens, well, not automatically, but often is associated with that is you also haven't learned all these important cultural things too. And that can be quite a shameful sort of feeling for right. people in that situation that they are too they are too shy to try and do all of that stuff at once because it's all really hard because as we all know, trying to learn a language when you're not two years old is really hard. It's really yeah. hard. And if you show up and your grandparents or elders are shaming you for not doing it right and also not knowing how to fish right or also not knowing how to cook right or do the other traditional cultural practices right, then everything's bad and you're bad at this and so you might as well just not even come. Exactly. Right? So that's pushing the blame where it actually belongs <laughs> onto the old people. No, sorry. Sorry, Nana. Like... <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I guess it's, it's the old people that want the young people to come. And so if they want to, to bring the young people in, they've got to figure out how to make it enticing for them. Yeah. And so this is a little bit of a point of tension in our context. And I think this is widespread in lots of other contexts where mm-hmm. people are having this issue. And so one thing that I try to do in my language, encouraging language learning practice or language teaching practice mm-hmm. is to, instead of putting the pressure to learn all these important traditional things and learn this language as a 12-year-old or a 20-year-old when it's 
you know, as hard as learning any other random thing, Mm -hmm. um, that I get the the students to try to talk about, talk about their phones and their iPads and the movies and their favorite movie stars and talk about the stuff that they feel culturally secure talking about Mm -hmm. and the things that they're interested in and things that they, it's not so much the interest side of it, because I think they are often interested in the things that they're already familiar with, but the things they feel confident engaging with. Mm -hmm. And so where they feel confident or even in a lot of cases excited, like you ask people to talk about Beyonce and they get very excited and (laughs) have a lot of things to say and they have good feelings when they're doing that. (laughs) And so, and that will, those good feelings will flow onto the feelings associated with learning the language. And instead of being stressed and worried, they'll be like, Oh, I'm thinking about Beyonce and learning how to do this kind of sentence. Like, you know, and it's a bit of a, rather than have like two sources of tension at once. Exactly. Exactly. So taking away one of those sources of tension and trying to trick them that the other one isn't that hard either. And it seems to be quite effective, at least for their happiness, that they're happier when they're doing it. Well, that's, but, that's a big part of language learning. You need to feel okay about doing exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. And you had students make videos about, was it Harry Potter in Cook Islands, Maori? Yeah, well, that was their... <laughs> Those students made the Harry Potter thing themselves. So I, I was surprised because I would have thought that Harry Potter is a little bit old these days, but apparently everyone still likes it. I don't know. I guess so. I, I don't know. I still like Harry yeah. Potter, I guess. But... <laughs> <laughs> and so they wanted to like retell the, the basic theme of the story of Harry Potter. Well, not quite, not quite. I mean, you can, do, I've got a whole series of these, um, uh, Tumbri Tor videos, that's the Cook Islands mighty way of saying Dumbledore, ah. um, which you can put a link to on here. But th- they just made that up themselves. So I have this method that I use in person, the face-to-face classroom, where I have a big box of toys that I get them to play with, to act out stories and do stuff. And they just decided one time several years ago that one of these particular little figurines was Dumbledore. Oh, okay. And they called him Tumbri Tor and just injected that Harry Potter stuff into the story. So it wasn't like they were retelling Harry Potter. They just sort of did a mismatch of Harry Potter and whatever and whatever. Whatever else the other figurines you know, were. What do they call that? Mashup. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely Harry Potter fan fiction. Yeah, well, yes. Much more than Harry Potter retelling. Yes, that is more accurate. Yes, it's, So okay. it started with that original one started off, I called it a Harry Potter whale rider crossover. Do you know the okay. film The Whale Rider? I, not really, but I guess it's about whales and people who ride them. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's a, it's a quite a good film. It's, um, it's about it's about so there's a, a iwi, a people on the east coast of the North Island of New Zealand, who their migration story involves their ancestor Paikia coming to Aotearoa, coming to New Zealand on a whale. Oh, okay. Um, and it's a story. The movie's a story set in that community. It's, it's good. I recommend it. Oh, good. it. Um, <clears throat> interestingly. That person, Paikia, mm-hmm. comes from Mauke, which is the island that I'm from in the Cook Islands. Oh, so we've got the other end of that story. So in their, oh. in their stories, like, he arrives on Tolaga Bay on that. And you guys are like, he leaves. Yeah, we've got the leaving part of the mm. story, yeah. Which in modern times, we've all reconnected with each other and we all, you know, oh, have cool. visited each other's places and all that kind of stuff. It was pretty sweet. So the, the Paikia, who is the person who woke, who is the, rail, the whale rider, comes from Mauke. Mm-hmm. And back back in Mauke, we've got a place which is his wife, who's now stoned because she waited so long for him to come back and he never come back because oh, he yeah. moved to Gisborne. Um, and then this, he's, this is crossing over with Dumbledore. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. So the, <laughs> so the story that they started off making was this mixture of those two things, and then it sort of just carried on because every time I teach that class, I say, make a better story than those last lot did. And so they just... Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So people keep adding... Yeah. This is a very kind of collaborative universe. Yes, exactly. You know, yeah, yeah uh, fan fiction sort of sort of context. Yeah, of- it's, it's gone away... Yeah, if you watch through the sequence, it's gone in some different directions. The most recent one, which is a couple of years old now, is about Trump. Oh, okay. And that election and other such. So it covers all kinds of contemporary life. Yeah. <laughs> so just various various different aspects of, of this kind of thing. And then so once these videos are created, what happens what happens to them afterwards? Can you use them again? Well, yeah, so the context I'm talking about here is the university language classroom with adults, and I make lots of little of these story videos as part of their process, but we just keep them, most of them, in-house. But the ones that they agree to, we put on on YouTube so that anybody can watch them and they can take it home and show their nana and get told off for talking funny or whatever. (laughs) More nana's actually got to stop. Like, (laughs) grandmothers are extremely important people in any family context. Like... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so 
because it can so it can lead to shared discussions between inter- different generations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, about the topics that, that the kids are already paying attention to. Yeah, and it demonstrates to their peers who maybe haven't had the chance to learn the language that maybe if you did, you could talk about these kind of things, and it wouldn't just always be the serious, serious traditional things. Yeah, it kind of makes the language cool. Yeah, for, for yeah. people for younger people. Yeah. I've also done this thing where in the small islands in the Cook Islands, the language is is good. Right. So all the children there speak the language and they use that language at school and it's all thriving and wonderful. But there's 200 people on one island and 60 people right. on one island and 400 people on another. So there's not many people there. But in that small population, it's thriving and doing really So there well. are kids in those small yeah. islands. So in those places, there are kids who are super competent speakers of that language and so another thing I've done along this sort of line of stuff is when I've been over there doing other stuff I have got some of the actual young children like sort of six to ten year olds six to twelve year olds sort of primary school children to make little stories little cartoon movies and comic strips and things like that which is fun for them because they get interested in literacy yeah in in their language and different modes of literacy so it's good for them but also what I'm after sort of more than that is then they make examples of cool kids language Right. That, if that goes into that collection, then the kids in New Zealand, which remember is most of our kids, right, um, can have access to other peer language instead of only having old people to talk to. I love old right. people. Like, no, but, but it's, like, it's important for them to know yeah. that this language is still, you yeah. know, in use among kids their age and can be used by kids their age. And it's not just like a grandma, grandpa thing that that old people do and it is something that that could be part of their lives the way it's part of these other kids lives exactly exactly so to use that as a model and to give them the chance to hear how it sounds and copy them and you know and try and be cool like them or whatever hopefully that's that's really awesome thank you so much for for coming on the show and talking to us if there was one thing you could leave people knowing about l- l- language or linguistics in general what what would that that be okay this one's kind of aimed aimed at Random people in New Zealand and <laughs> linguists, which is, please stop calling Cook Islands Māori Rarotongan. Rarotongan is not the correct word. Rarotongan is not the right name for this language because Rarotongan is the name for the specific variety that comes from Rarotonga. And uh, everybody who doesn't come from Rarotonga doesn't like it when the whole language gets called Rarotongan. And the Rarotongan people don't like it either, because it's not accurate. It's if they're taking credit for whole thing. So that's one island yeah, of so the 15 Cook Islands. Yes, that's right. So it's the, it's the big one. Right. And it's the one that got used to translate the Bible and all that kind of stuff. So right. there's all these political tensions. But, but most Cook Island people, nearly everybody, I think, mm-hmm. don't like to have the whole language referred to by that name. And some people get a bit muddled up there, like, but Cook Islands Māori is like, use English words. It's like, well, right. Rarotongan's not a Māori word either. Like, that's, that's actually like an English ending. Yeah, it's got yeah. an English ending on it. Like, and there is no Māori name for the whole, group the whole of group of islands because the group of islands was only put together by accident. You know, it's not a historically a Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a colonial place. construct yeah. of yeah. people coming in and calling them all something. Yeah. So, um, so there isn't a, a traditional name for that place because it's not a traditional place there's an yeah. adapted version of the pronunciation of that that's in your twitter handle though right yeah so sometimes we call it te reo cookie irony but cookie irony is just the words cook islands um, but pronounced pronounced in a Maori way yeah 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 good so cook islands maori which will definitely be what we call it in the description for this episode you've never known any different probably most of the people who are listening to this uh so you're already doing the right thing yeah good For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, Spotify, wherever else you get your podcasts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. Lauren tweets and blogs as Superlinguo, and I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. You can follow Aki Nicholas on Twitter at at te, te underscore reo, R-E-O, underscore K-A, which we will also link to from the show notes. To listen to bonus episodes and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash enthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Current bonus topics include behind-the-scenes episode about linguistics conferences, special Q&A episode, and more. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay, too. We also really appreciate if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our audio producer is Claire Gaughan, our editorial producers are Emily Graff and A.E. Prevost, and our music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Enthusiastic!